she was a master of tricks, never leaving behind any clues. A virtuoso in her craft, she was only successful because she lacked humanity. No one could have guessed that a smart but quiet girl would become one of the most sophisticated criminals in the world, responsible for a long list of adventures that financed her evolution from an ordinary girl into a dangerous figure leading a luxurious lifestyle, with a penchant for murder. The ruthless con artist was a true embodiment of evil, always staying one step ahead of the police, until finally, they had the chance to confront her face to face. On Thursday, July 19, 1990, residents of Florida, Steve and Jane McGowan, received a letter from their 34-year-old sister, Beverly. She bid them farewell and wrote that she was embarking on a journey to find herself in this world. Beverly added that she was quitting her job and selling her apartment because she intended to leave immediately. The contents of the letter deeply shocked the brother and sister. Beverly had worked hard and was satisfied with both her job and her new home. She had recently acquired the apartment she had dreamed of and worked two jobs to pay off the mortgage. Jane hurried to the police station to report her sister's disappearance, but the authorities could do little since the letters stated that Beverly had left of her own accord. The letters were written in Beverly's handwriting on notepad sheets found at her home. So Steve and Jane went home to Beverly in Pompano Beach to try and find answers to their questions. They immediately noticed that Beverly's red Volkswagen Fox was not in its usual parking spot. Beverly herself was not in the apartment, but it did not give the impression that she had packed up and left for good. There were dirty dishes in the sink, a nightshirt lay on the unmade bed, and clothes hung in the closet. However, there were also signs that Beverly had no intention of returning. The phone was disconnected, the answering machine was missing, and there was no sign of her two cats. Steve and Jane rummaged through drawers and discovered that Beverly's passport, birth certificate, and address book were also missing. Beverly worked in the loan department of a bank and had a part-time job at a non-profit organization. Steve contacted the bank to see if her colleagues could shed light on the situation. They informed him that the day before he received the farewell letter, Beverly had taken a sick day, citing illness. This was unusual considering Beverly's reputation as a responsible, and reliable employee. During the phone call, she also mentioned that she no longer wanted to live in her apartment and asked them to sell the mortgaged property and get rid of her personal belongings left in the apartment. Beverly was asked to send a telegram confirming her request, and such a telegram was indeed received. Although the circumstances were strange, Steve and Jane had to believe that their sister had truly left without explaining herself to anyone. However, Steve managed to convince the police to file a missing person report and he closed Beverly's credit cards. He reasoned that closing the cards would disrupt her travel plans and anger her enough to compel her to contact the family. On the same evening that Steve and Jane were inspecting their sister's apartment, a fisherman and his young niece went to search for bait for an upcoming fishing trip. They arrived at a wide irrigation canal located 160 kilometers north of Pompano Beach in a remote area of St. Lucie County. Leaving his niece in the car, the fisherman began walking along the canal when he noticed something that appeared to be a bag of trash. As he approached closer and realized what it was, he hurried back to the car and contacted the police. Deputies from the St. Lucie County Sheriff's Office, who arrived at the location indicated by the fisherman discovered the body of a woman. It was evident that the perpetrator not only took her life, but also made every effort to prevent her from being identified. However, he overlooked something. On the woman's right ankle, hidden beneath her jeans, there was a small tattoo of a yellow rose. The description of the tattoo was released to the media in the hopes that local residents could identify it. Steve McGowan had already returned home when the phone rang around 10 p.m. It was a friend of his missing sister. She had just heard the news about the discovery in the St. Lucie Canal and the matching tattoo that Beverly had. The next day, Steve and Jane went to St. Lucie to speak with investigators and show them a photograph of their sister's tattoo. Due to the condition of the body, traditional identification methods had to be ruled out, but both of them were confident that it was their Beverly. 
Dental Records comparison confirmed that it was indeed her. The inspection of Beverly's apartment did not reveal any blood or suspicious items. There were no signs of a struggle. Steve and Jane couldn't understand who would harm their sister. She loved her family, especially her nephews, and they loved her. Beverly was not wealthy and was not involved in complicated relationships. Her life was overshadowed by the fact that her two boyfriends died in separate car accidents. However, despite her past, Steve was confident that Beverly had been quite content with her life recently. Although Beverly worked two jobs, it was not enough to cover her mortgage payments. To increase her income, she started renting out one of the bedrooms in her apartment. During the search of her apartment, investigators found a notebook with a list of potential tenants. Each entry included the full name, phone number, and the scheduled time for viewing the apartment. Except for one. The first line only had the name Alice, and was marked for Tuesday at 6.30. After meeting Alice, Beverly spoke highly of her. The woman had come from London, dressed impeccably, drove an impressive car, and worked for the renowned company IBM. Alice had moved to the region because she was temporarily transferred to the company's office in Fort Lauderdale. She had impressed Beverly to the point that she chose her as the new neighbor and informed her friend that Alice would be moving in on Friday, July 20. By the way, Beverly mentioned that Alice introduced her to numerology. Alice attempted to predict Beverly's future, but she needed various numbers that held significance in Beverly's life, such as her date of birth, passport number, social security number, and even details from her driver's license. Strangely enough, Beverly provided her with all of these numbers. Overall, she was satisfied with Alice's predictions about her future and shared them with her friends. Unfortunately, she did not share the last name of her new neighbor with them. Alice's identity remained a mystery. Additionally, there was no evidence to suggest that Alice had moved in or even visited Beverly's apartment. The investigators reached out to IBM, where they were informed that they had no employees from the UK working in the South Florida area. They didn't even have an office in Fort Lauderdale. The investigation into Beverly's finances revealed that on the day her body was found, someone withdrew $795 out of the $800 that was in her bank account. Her credit card was then used to purchase women's clothing and books at a shopping center in Miami. The salespeople who served the customer described her as a bright blonde with a British accent. The description matched that of a tall blonde woman who had attracted nationwide attention at the time. Eight years earlier, in 1992, police officer Laurie Bembinick had been sentenced to life in prison for the murder of her ex-husband's former wife. The case had caused a sensation. Laurie's glamorous appearance combined with the high-profile nature of the case made her somewhat of a celebrity. A few days before Beverly's murder, Laurie had escaped from prison in Wisconsin. When the Miami salesperson was shown photographs of Laurie Bembinick, they recognized her as the woman who had used Beverly's credit card. The police were puzzled as to how the convicted killer's path could have crossed with that of a modest bank employee until it was discovered that Laurie had actually fled to Canada, and was not in Florida at the time of the crime. However, on Friday July 20, one day after Beverly's body was discovered, her card was used again in Miami, this time at a travel agency. The cardholder had a notable appearance. It appeared to be a man dressed as a woman. The person wore a cheap, black wig in the style of Cleopatra, and oval-shaped glasses. The man spoke with a British accent, and introduced himself as Sam. Apparently, Sam was planning to fly to London in two days, on July 22, and used the card to purchase a ticket for British Airways Flight 92. Detectives examined the passenger registration records for Flight 292, as well as all other flights heading to Britain on July 22. Beverly McGowan's name was not on any of them. However, Beverly's car was found in the airport parking lot, where it had been parked for five days. Fingerprints found inside the car yielded no significant results, but four synthetic black wig hairs were discovered. 
British Airways Flight 292 arrived at Heathrow Airport on Monday, July 23, according to London Time. After landing, a passenger with short black hair and oval glasses approached the Avis car rental counter. The passenger, presumably Sam, booked a car in Beverly McGowan's name and handed over her driver's license as proof. Beverly had shoulder-length dark hair and wore glasses. The person at the counter resembled her. The clerk asked for a credit card to pay for the car's fuel, and Sam handed over Beverly's Visa card, but the card was declined. Sam explained that they might have exceeded the limit, and paid in cash. In reality, by that time, Beverly's brother Steve had cancelled her credit cards. When Florida detectives learned about this unsuccessful transaction, Sam had long disappeared. Since the credit card was no longer active, its transactions could not be traced. Sam's arrival in Britain meant that he was beyond the jurisdiction of American law enforcement agencies. Florida detectives contacted the London police to request their assistance. Detective John Cornish agreed to help with the international investigation. He spoke with the Avis company and instructed their staff to direct the suspect to their nearest office if he contacted them. Later that same week, Sam did contact Avis. He requested an extension on the car rental, and he was asked to visit the nearby Avis office. The police waited for him at the location, but Sam never showed up. A backup plan was devised, where officers would wait at Heathrow Airport on the day of the car's return. That day arrived, but Sam once again failed to appear. In the early morning hours, Sam's abandoned car was found a few miles from the airport, devoid of any clues. Suspecting that Sam might be attempting to fly back to the United States, Detective Cornish ordered his team to board all flights heading to the US on that day to check the passengers, but this endeavor proved futile. The police missed the opportunity to apprehend the criminal. The only lead the police had left was British Airways Flight 292, since Sam didn't use Beverly's passport to board the flight, it meant he had booked a ticket under a different name. Investigators attempted to examine the 248 passengers on that flight, but by law, they were not allowed to check passengers who didn't reside in Florida. Therefore, they sought assistance from the U.S. State Department in Washington, D.C. Each passenger's name had to be compared with passport details, and since there was no unified database that consolidated all this information, the process could take years. It wasn't until January 1996 that the State Department provided the police with a name they deemed important. Sylvia and Hodgkinson, a British citizen, was on flight 292. The photo in her passport depicted a woman with dark hair and eyebrows. After her husband's death, she was forced to move into a women's shelter as she had nowhere else to go. Less than a year after her husband's death, a passport was issued in her name. Investigators suspected that someone else had impersonated Sylvia to obtain documents in her name. Since they couldn't locate Sylvia, in any way, there was concern that she had suffered a fate similar to Beverly's. The State Department also discovered an intriguing connection between Sylvia and two other women, Charlotte Ray Cowan, and Elaine Antoinette Parent. All three identities turned out to be inadvertently linked after an incident that occurred a year after Beverly's murder. On May 22, 1991, North Miami police approached a woman in a rented car. The car had been rented six months earlier in Los Angeles and was overdue for return. Stolen license plates were attached to the car to conceal its origin. Inside the car sat a tall, redhead woman who identified herself as Charlotte Ray Cowan and presented her documents to the officers. It was clear that Charlotte had been staying in the car with two dogs. Several wigs, the woman's personal diary, and a number of documents with Charlotte's photograph but different names, Sylvia Hodgkinson and Elaine Parent, were found in the car. The police arrested Charlotte based on her failure to return the rented car. She spent a night in jail and posted bail the next day. Remarkably, despite the woman's obvious use of false identities, the police took no action regarding this matter. On the day of Charlotte's court hearing for the offense, 
one of the arresting officers was present in the building. When it was time for Charlotte to appear before the court, a redhead woman stood up. However, the officer who had arrested Charlotte was shocked. The woman summoned to court by the subpoena, was not the same woman he had taken into custody. Charlotte herself couldn't understand why she had suddenly received a court summons. She asked the officer if the woman he had arrested was tall and a redhead. When he answered yes, she confidently stated that she knew exactly who it was. Nearly ten years earlier, in the mid-80s, Charlotte was relaxing at a bar in Orlando when an elegantly dressed woman with a British accent approached her. She had short red hair, like Charlotte, and amazing blue eyes. The woman introduced herself as an Trumont and offered to buy Charlotte a drink. Charlotte accepted the offer, and they engaged in casual conversation. During their chat, Anne casually brought up the topic of numerology. She mentioned that she would be happy to create a corresponding matrix for Charlotte and started by asking for her date of birth. One by one, Anne extracted Charlotte's social security number and driver's license details. She jotted everything down on a napkin and gave Charlotte a positive prediction about her future. Anne and Charlotte became instant friends and started communicating. A few days later, Charlotte met Anne's brother, a tall blonde man with the same elegant demeanor as his sister. However, over time, the women saw less of each other until they completely lost touch. So Charlotte was quite surprised when, several months later, Anne called her and said that her aunt had passed away, leaving her a significant inheritance. Anne was supposed to share the money with her brother but claimed that he had decided to have her institutionalized to claim all the money for himself. About a month after the phone call, Anne appeared on Charlotte's doorstep at 3 a.m. She had a moustache, wig, and a man's shirt with a tie. Sobbing, she explained that she had escaped from the institution where her brother had placed her. She was hiding from her family and needed help to disappear. And begged Charlotte to allow her to take her birth certificate so that she could create a new identity for herself. Initially, Charlotte refused, but she reluctantly agreed when she saw how distraught Anne was. Her friend promised to return the birth certificate soon. Weeks passed, and Charlotte heard nothing from Anne. She began to worry. Then, finally, she received a letter with the birth certificate and a note from Anne, apologizing for the delay. Charlotte didn't hear anything more about her friend until the moment she received a court summons in 1991. Hearing this fascinating story, the investigators became intrigued by the identity of the elusive and enigmatic fraudster, Elaine Parent. Like others, Parent was a real person, but little was known about her life. She was born in the Bronx, New York, on August 4, 1942. She was the only child of loving and fairly affluent parents. By the time she reached adulthood, she had transformed into a tall, slender beauty with dark hair and piercing blue eyes. At the age of 30, she moved to Florida and worked for a while at a real estate agency until her arrest in 1976 in Fort Lauderdale for shoplifting. Her fingerprints were taken and stored in the database. Then, in 1985, she stole jewelry worth $40,000 from an elderly acquaintance. This was around the same time Parent met Charlotte. Parent's fingerprints were compared to those of the woman arrested in 1991 for failing to return a rented car. They matched. The woman masquerading as Charlotte Coven, was Elaine Parent. Naturally, the conclusion was drawn that the new neighbor, Beverly McGowan Ellis, the elusive suspect Sam, and Elaine Parent were one and the same person. However, they still needed to directly link Elaine to Beverly's murder. The detectives reviewed the evidence in the case and examined a notebook containing letters Beverly had written to her brother and sister using an electrostatic detection device, ESDA. This specialized equipment is used to detect indentations or impressions on paper left by previously written letters. The analysis of the notebook revealed that it had been used for a series of other letters written not in Beverly's handwriting. It seemed the author was a woman who held a strong grudge against Beverly. The messages were rather aggressive and contained threats. 
The letters were compared to handwriting samples from Elaine Parent, and they matched. The letters written by Parent were addressed to a woman in London who held a high-ranking position as the CEO of a major company. For her safety in the case materials, she was referred to as Witness X. She shed light on many gaps in the life of the elusive fraudster. The woman revealed that she had met Elaine during a trip to Miami in the 1980s, and they quickly became friends. In 1985, when the police were searching for Elaine for the jewelry theft, she apparently fled to London and asked Witness X if she could stay with her. However, the two young women soon realized that they couldn't live together due to Elaine's explosive temperament and instability. In 1990, the con artist returned to the United States, but to Witness X's surprise, she returned to London at the end of July. She was driving a car rented from Ives. Three months after her return to London, Parent stole two dogs belonging to her former friend and escaped to the United States. From there, she sent threatening letters to Witness X and attempted to extort a ransom for her dogs. These dogs were evidently the same ones found in her possession during her arrest in Miami in 1991. By the end of 1996, Parent faced charges of passport forgery from the State Department, but they had no idea where she could be hiding. In 1998, the television show America's Most Wanted aired an episode about Elaine Parent. When the show began, Patricia Nevins from St. Petersburg, Florida, was at home watching television. As soon as she saw Elaine's photo, she immediately recognized her. Patricia Nevins was a church worker and knew Elaine as a blonde named Sandra Little. Patricia met Sandra Little in 1992 when she was living in a homeless shelter in St. Petersburg. Patricia allowed Sandra to stay in her vacant bedroom, and she remained with her for almost 1.5 years. During this period, Sandra filed a lawsuit against a restaurant where she slipped and injured herself. She won the case and received compensation, the amount of which is undisclosed. Patricia described several curious incidents that occurred while she lived with Elaine. Elaine once told her that one way for her to lead a dignified life was to assume a different identity. Then, during a dinner party, parent mimed cutting a guest's hand to steal a gold bracelet. Patricia arranged for Elaine to speak with a psychiatrist, who later informed Patricia that Elaine was an extremely intelligent sociopath, who would leave Patricia's life as quickly as she entered it. This prediction came true when the women went their separate ways in 1993. After the police publicly appealed to the community to help capture Elaine, an intriguing letter was delivered to the office of the St. Lucie County Sheriff. Inside was a copy of a painting done in oil colors. It depicted Elaine Parent wearing a teal green swimsuit and pearl earrings. Her hair was gray and styled in the same manner Parent often chose. She was portrayed coming out of a pool. On the back, it was printed, Best Wishes, Your Chameleon. Psychiatrist Barbara Kavan, who had been assisting the police in the case, stated that Parent both desperately needed, and feared police attention. The painting is very telling. She sent it to the police to taunt them, as if to say, I'm alive, I'm okay, look for me, but you'll never find me. In February 1999, Elaine was featured in the documentary series World's Most Wanted, which brought her international attention. Reports poured in from around the world claiming to have seen parent in Turkey, France, Australia, and South Africa. The press dubbed her the most wanted woman in the world. In April 2002, America's Most Wanted aired another episode about Elaine Parent. Following the program, numerous calls came in from the affluent neighborhood of Panama City, Florida, claiming that a woman living there was Elaine. Three police officers were dispatched to the address. They arrived at a modest single-story house and knocked on the door. A middle-aged brunette woman, dressed in a beige silk pajama set, answered the door. The officers explained why they had come to see her. The woman introduced herself as Darlene Thompson and presented them with her military ID, which featured her photograph. She did not resemble the photograph of Elaine Parent that the officers had seen. Realizing that the neighbors had made a mistake, 
the officers nevertheless asked her to accompany them to the station for formalities. Darlene agreed and requested that the officers wait while she changed clothes. While the officers waited outside the bedroom, one of them examined Darlene's ID. Being a former military personnel, he immediately noticed a crucial missing stamp that confirmed the document's authenticity. The officer knocked on the bedroom door to clarify this matter, to which she responded that she was getting dressed. The officers waited for her to come out, but she never appeared. A gunshot rang out, and the officers rushed into the bedroom only to find Darlene dead. Subsequent fingerprint analysis officially confirmed that Darlene and Elaine Parent were the same person. It turned out that the house where Elaine lived belonged to another woman. Elaine had been renting a room from her since August 2001. The homeowner described her as a pleasant woman with a passion for cooking. During the search of the house, Elaine's Florida driver's license was found, featuring her photo but under the name of the woman she was staying with. In a notebook, she had written down information about a man from the neighboring town of Lynn Haven, including his social security number and credit cards. Elaine's closet was filled with wigs and both women's and men's clothing. A book on learning the French language and another on theatrical makeup were also discovered. Some acquaintances of Elaine mentioned that she often worked on a laptop, but it was never found. The diary she had with her when she was arrested over 10 years ago as Charlotte Cavan was also missing. Another intriguing detail to the portrait emerged, the police found a flyer with a photograph of Elaine and the name Antonia Racermen. The flyer stated that she was being sought by the FBI for the murder of a government official at a hotel in Washington. Interestingly, it appeared that Elaine had created the flyer herself, and the local police chief later speculated that she had made it to intimidate someone. The death of Elaine left many unanswered questions. The police believe she had up to 20 different identities that she used across the world, including the USA, UK, Turkey, Israel, France, and South Africa. Some suspect that she may have committed more murders, but no additional victims have been found. Three years prior to her death, investigator Norma Pfeiffer told the media, the brutality of the Maguire murder makes me think that someone capable of this has either done it before or will do it again. Opinions are divided as to whether she worked alone or had an accomplice. Some argued that she couldn't have managed Beverly on her own. And let's not forget about the attractive blonde man she presented as her brother. Psychologist Barbara Kerwin described Elaine as a virtuoso in her field, capable of effortlessly reading people's souls and uncovering their vulnerable spots. However, the motive behind her crimes remains completely unclear. Why would someone with Elaine's high intellect choose to engage in criminal activities instead of achieving great heights in any other field, especially considering that her crimes brought her more infamy than wealth? But Kerwin believes she knows the reason behind Elaine's schemes. She was driven by her own psychological demons, Barbara stated. I believe she impulsively stole the identities of others to fill her own emptiness.